One thing about Value Entertainment is I'm always looking for strong talent that can bring different type of value to everybody, as well as somebody that brings entertainment as well. This next host that will be doing shows on Saturdays for the next few weeks, I am very excited about because my good friend Kelly Nishimoto, she's worked with many celebrities in Hollywood in the retail side, fashion side. You'll be surprised who she's worked with when she tells you this. And she's going to give you the perspective of what it is to be an entrepreneur as a woman entrepreneur in the retail business and how she went from Atlanta, Georgia to Miami to LA and making a name for herself in fashion. So here is my good friend from Cute Booty, Kelly Nishimoto. I've always bartended and cocktailed pretty much since I was 18 and that's kind of in my mind how I was going to generate money to start my own business and obviously my business was going to be in fashion, I just didn't quite know what area I was going to do. So I was bartending at the Spanish Kitchen in Los Angeles and uh, I really started focusing on my designs. I started making corsets, I was making corsets for celebrities, Gwen Stefani, Madonna, Dave Navarro, uh, Anastasia, somehow, some way. The contacts I was making bartending, it just brought me more and more clients. Uh, so in 2005, I wanted to really turn it into a business. So I found an investor, great guy. Um, he invested initially $250,000, and here we are. We're ready to go to the races. Well, I launched at Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. I'm on top of the world. Our first season in business, we sold, I want to say, about $600,000. Uh, that's in a six-month period. So for the year, you know, we did over a million dollars in sales. but. I'm kind of new to the business, I'm learning the manufacturing process, I wasted a lot of money and we didn't ship a lot of merchandise. Cut to season two and then season three, I believe season three we sold about 750000 My business partner at the time just did not want to put in any more money into manufacturing. We were losing our asses in manufacturing. That was devastating. You know, you're brand new in the fashion industry, you've only been doing it for a year and a half and your very first business partner throws in the towel. Here I am, I've got a beautiful office space, I have four employees. How do I close the doors? In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not closing the doors, I'm gonna continue my business. So what did I do? That was my first catastrophic event. My partner pulls out, what do I do? Well, first of all, I had to reconfigure my budget. I don't have any money, I'm a bartender. You know, I, I made good money, I probably made, I wanna say $2,000 a week. That $2,000 a week had to pay the bills, it had to pay my employees, it had to pay two rents, my home rent and my office rent. So I really felt like I had to hustle. Uh, so what did I do? I reconfigured my budget, and I got a smaller space that cost less. I picked up another bartending shift so I could make sure my employees were paid. I tightened up my product line. I decreased my amount, of, my number of products, and I kind of honed in on what my best sellers were. And I took that avenue, and that's the only thing I produced. I produced my best sellers. I ended up rebranding and relaunching my brand. What does this do? It gives you the chance to kind of see what's important, what's selling, how you're going to do it, how much money you have. But another thing that it does is it reinvigorates people's excitement for what you're doing. So when you relaunch or rebrand, it's an opportunity to have an event and invite all of the people in your circle to come and support. Now, you have to turn that support into sales, so what do I do? I rebrand to Cute Booty, uh, I have a big launch event, and I make sure I have merchandise to sell. Cost me $5,000 to relaunch and to throw that event, and I generated $10,000 that night, so I paid for what it cost me to throw the party, and then I had an additional $5,000 in capital. You always have to be constantly reinvesting your money. You know, when you're using your own money, you're constantly chasing your ass. When it's your own money, you, ha you have this much, you know, whatever that amount is, and you can't spend it all at one time. You have to make sure you have enough. So in the fashion business, it's important to have inventory, but I'm not going to spend my whole nugget on inventory at one time. So the idea is to reinvest your money on a monthly basis. All right, so second catastrophic event. What happened in 2008? <laughs> Economy crashes. Stores are going out of business left and right. People can't pay their bills. Here I am, I'm in the luxury clothing business. My main wholesale accounts were Macy's, Equinox, and Yoga Works. Guess what? I lost all three. Macy's went into reconstruction, they cut all of their new vendors, and they put all their money into a new marketing campaign for that Christmas. That right there was probably $250,000 in sales for that year alone, if not more. All the boutiques that I was selling to, the small boutiques, they're all going out of business, they're all struggling. So I start counting my money. How much money do I have out there? $140,000 of uncollected money from the small boutiques. No one's answering their phones, emails aren't being answered, even when you walk up, some, some days I would just go do a casual visit, doors closed, closed, it's just, it was just out of control. No one was paying their bills, which means I had no money to continue to run my business. 
what do you gotta do? You gotta, you gotta think outside the box. You have to think about what you can do to generate income to keep your business going. So I started an online store. This is a perfect opportunity to switch over from wholesale to retail. Your profit margins are higher. You can get more creative with your marketing. You can deal with your customers on an individual basis. To me, it was an exciting way to still have my business, but rethink it. Think outside the box. What can I do that's new? What's going on now in the world? What's going on? Social media had just started up, so we were really utilizing those areas to just relaunch the brand once more. This was more of an internal relaunch because no one really knew on the outside what was going on. It was just me and my staff, but it was so important and just to learn from our mistakes and continue on and figure out what the new or what the next step is. You know, my, my thing always is, Lord, show me the hustle and I'll go hustle it. You give me the opportunity. I don't need you to work for me. I don't need you to give me money. I don't need any favors or handouts. Show me a hustle, show me a job, show me a way that I can go make money and I'm gonna go do it. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I bartend. Who do I know and how can I utilize that information to make me more money than just bartending? So I started making uniforms for all the nightclubs and restaurants in Hollywood. I mean, that alone generated an extra $20,000 a month. I mean, that's huge. And all I was doing, I was doing the same thing within my realms. I'm manufacturing clothing, I'm, I'm being creative. So you just have to think of what you can do that's just a little bit different that can also help you generate income. The number three catastrophic event in my life, this is, this is, uh, this one was a big one. Yeah, this one was big. So I had kind of just gotten my business back on track after the economy crashed. I started looking into more ways to generate income and a, a big swimwear company, Beach Bunny Swimwear, approached me about kind of a private label line for them. Now private label basically means a company orders white label from you. They order your product, I manufacture it, but I put their label on it. I actually told them no three or four times and they kept coming back. We love your stuff, it's a great fit, please work with us. We, we think your products would go well with our swimsuit line. So finally after we talked about the money and they said, you know, we'll pay your wholesale prices. It's no big deal. We just want our own colors and we want your product. Okay, great. So their test order, I want to say, was about $175,000 test order. You know, yes, I'm excited. Let's do $175,000. I'm thinking, you know, my business has been in the, the crapper from the economy. Of course I want this account. So I, we started working together for nine months, 10 months. Everything was amazing. We made all of the merchandise for them with their label on it. They sold it. I got a paycheck. You know, we did a million dollars in business that year. That was 2000 and kind of halfway between 2009 and 2010. Well, about that nine, 10 month mark, their orders were getting bigger. Their collections that I was uh, creating for them got bigger and bigger and bigger. They called me in for a meeting and they literally tried to bully me for three hours into giving them lower prices. Why won't I give them lower prices? Why don't I just come and work for them? Why can't I just be their designer and you know they oversee everything and maybe we use their manufacturers? And I'm like, look guys, I'm, I'm a clothing company. I've had this company for years. Cute Booty is, a, is an established, known product. You know, so for them to corner me into that and to try to get lower prices, you know, I was willing to budge a little bit and I budged a lot, but they were trying to get 30 and 40% cheaper pricing out of me, which means that, I, that there's no profit in there for me. There's no way that I would be able to run my business and keep my employees going. So obviously I said no and uh, they agreed to continue on. We love, we still love your stuff. We're going to see what the sales are. And they did, you know, and then they strung me on for about three months, I wanna say. They can't get the samples back because they're in a sales meeting in Dubai, they're selling here, they wanna get all their sales numbers together for me. But the owner can confirm that all styles and all colors will be bought. Great, to me, that's, a, that's an agreement, that's a contract. So finally, after the third month of us asking, hey, where's the order, where's the purchase order? It should have been the biggest order. It should have been about a $550,000 order. We get an email saying that uh, Beach Bunny Swimwear has decided to no longer, what did, I don't even remember the words they use, employ or contract Kelly Nishimoto for our collection. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't employ me. And, and it's my collection, I created that. That's my brains, my design. And then the next day, it was everything was on their website. And I hadn't produced one stitch of it, it was all my designs on their website. They had actually gone over to Dubai and China and knocked everything off. It's a hot design. They'll basically take it and out the back door and they'll manufacture hundreds of thousands of pieces and it ends up in the Chinese market. 
So eventually, one of my designs, it just ended up in all kinds of negative places that I didn't want it. Well, at the same time, um, we got robbed. We got robbed while I was out of town, and they actually stole everything. They took everything, TV, microwave, um, clothes, bags, I mean, anything you can steal. It was just gone. They ransacked the house. And um, we lost our house. We lost our house the same. We lost our house first, and then, then we moved into a smaller place, and that's when we got robbed. So it's just all these things piling on top of you. How do you handle it? How do you deal with it? So great news, I booked a TV show. I booked something borrowed, something new on TLC. So here we are, don't really have a house. All of our, my money is being sucked into a, a lawsuit because I ended up having to take beach money to court. I mean, it, just how much crap can you pile on one person? Oh, well, then I'm pregnant. So, you know, it's just one thing after, I, I don't even, I really, sometimes I don't even know how I got through it. There's a lot of things that I learned after the fact, and what I learned is I had a pattern of how I dealt with things. And when I really broke those down, it was almost, it's survival, but it's a smart way to deal with catastrophic events in business and in life, and it makes so much sense. And so when I sat down to write them down, I'm like, yes, this is, this is the list, whether it was conscious or unconscious, this is what I did every single time I had a major fail in life. Number one, you have to process the info. If you don't process what's going on and you ignore it, it's never, you just have to face it. You'll never get anywhere if you don't process the information. Number two, you have to assess your options. Okay, some crazy shit just happened, now what do I do? How do I get through it? What, what, what is this? What do I do and how do I get through it? What are my options? Number three, examine your resources. Who do you know? Get creative. It's, you're, not, you're not trying to pull a favor for nothing. You're trying to survive and grow and, and get past this, like move past this catastrophic event. Number four, think of a hustle. Think of your hustle. Get to, think outside the box. What is your hustle? What are you good at? What can you make money at? Um, while you're helping your business to survive, what can you do elsewhere to bring in income, to generate that money? Number five, you wanna create a strategy to move forward. Is it rethinking how you're going about your business? Is it rebranding? What, what can you do to create a strategy to move forward? What are the possibilities of moving forward? Number six, cut your losses and don't dwell. Cut your losses, trim the fat. This isn't work, you suck, you, you didn't support me, you took advantage of me, you tried to take a piece of my business when you didn't deserve it, cut your losses, cut your losses, know your worth, and don't dwell on the situation. Number seven, this is a very hard one to do. Um, sometimes it takes many years to get to this step, and that's forgive yourself and others. Uh, forgive yourself for making the mistake or for misstepping or for not having that contract, I think that's, um, that's a very personal one and that's something that you really have to sit within yourself and do. Uh, the forgiving others is what takes the time. Forgiving others, you know, not judging them for their actions or blaming them or you just gotta let it go. You gotta let it go. Trust me, you'll free. Something inside you is freed when you don't, when you just let that energy go. Number eight, acknowledge what you're thankful for. I mean, shit, my life sucks right now. My business sucks. I can barely pay my bills. But what are you thankful for? Do you have a healthy family? Um, are you thankful for the lessons that you've learned? You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, what are you thankful for? Look around. Some, you just Maybe you're just thankful for a breath. Jeez, that's like some people can't even breathe. It sounds cliche, but yeah, I'm thankful for my creative brain, I'm thankful for my family, and I'm thankful for the ability to be able to move on. Number nine, and this is one of my favorites, wipe off your face and keep on moving. Wipe those tears. So in 2012, Katy Perry had this movie. Maybe some of you saw it, maybe some of you didn't. Um, she's a, a friend of my sister, so we, we went to the theater and we watched her movie, um, what was it, A Part of Me? And I just remember she was going through her breakup or her divorce with Russell Brand. And you, you could just feel her pain. You could feel every emotion inside of her came through on this big screen. So here you've got Katy Perry preparing for one of the biggest shows in her life. She literally is so distraught from her relationship, she can't even get into the makeup chair. And it was almost like a, I mean, it was almost like a wounded animal. I mean, just, just thinking about it, it makes me tear up. So here's Katy Perry in the makeup, she's literally bawling. Her hair, her hair girl and her makeup girl are just trying to do her face, get her ready for this show. And she peels herself out of the chair, just moaning in pain 
in emotional distress. She gets onto this elevator thing that lifts her up to the stage. And you see, you see everything in her body transition. So here she's crying, tears are streaming down her face. That girl literally wipes her face and stands up straight and shakes it off. And when that elevator hit that floor, she stepped out with those gorgeous legs and her little shiny flapper girl outfit. And she sang the hell out of that song. And you would have never known that she was basically laying on the floor, dying over what was going on in her life. So that's it. Those are my personal ways on how to get over catastrophic events in your business life and your personal life. And you know, sometimes they, they mix together and you really have no control over it. And it's, you know, it's not how many times you fall. Uh, I fall on a hell of a lot of times. It's how many times you can get up. And you just keep getting up, you keep getting up, and it's all about persistence. And um, that's pretty much it. That's my, my lesson for the day. I'd love to hear you know, some of your stories. Um, feel free to reach out to me on the comments below. And even though this was a little bit of a sad episode, I think it's gonna be super helpful for you guys. So don't forget to subscribe to Valuetainment. And you know what the goal is. A million subscribers, guys. All right, see you later.